Are Demons Real? from fellowshipofthemartyrs.com Some people don't think demons are real at all, but that just flies in the face of the specific command of our Lord in the Great Commission in Mark 16, 15 through 18, that we're to go into all the world and cast demons out of people. It also flies in the face of the normal daily experience of Christians all over the world that are wrestling with spiritual powers and principalities and wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6:12. The New Testament sure spends a lot of time training us up and explaining that our battle is not against flesh and blood, for it to all be worthless because demons don't really exist. I can assure you that they do, and that they're real, and that the vast majority of people, even Christians, have stuff messing with them that needs to be demolished with prejudice. If demons aren't real, then who is it that's talking to all the witches and warlocks loose in our public schools? Who's telling the psychics on TV details about dead people? Yeah, some of that stuff is fake, but some of it's real, too. There is a war between good and evil, and I can't hardly see how you can believe in Jesus and angels and not think demons and Satan are real. And if they're real, they're doing stuff to slow us down. They're not just hanging around Ouija boards and toy stores. Go to any third world country and ask them if they've seen demons and know that they're real. For years, I didn't believe they were real, and despite being a Christian, when the Lord gave me the gift of discernment of spirits, I realized how much they had been oppressing me for years, including lust and gluttony and sloth and love of money and fear and others. I wasn't free until I learned how to get them off and keep them off. Okay, so let's make a list of stuff and see if you think it comes from your own flawed nature or from the enemy. I don't believe demons can possess Christians, but they can sure oppress them. They surely do hang around and mess with us and try to gain an entry. Else why would the Lord urge us to keep watch over our houses so that the enemy can't return stronger? Some Christians open all the doors, throw their arms around them, and give them the best seat in the house. If you do what they tell you to do, they might as well possess you for how much control they've got over you. Mark 12, 43-45 says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house, from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Do you get that? You can get free from them, and then they can come back if you're not watching, even if the house is swept clean and in order. Have you ever met a non-Christian whose house is swept clean and in order? That requires the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself is warning Christians here that they can come back, and they will probably come back worse. So it's possible that a person could find Christ, get saved, get cleaned out, get lazy, and they would come back worse? Yes. There's no other way to explain the behavior of some Christians. Forget your theoretical models and look around. We're riddled with badness. Not sure yet? Okay, so fear is a spirit, and it's not from God. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So, if you have one of these, the Word of God says it's a spirit, and it's not from God. And since you only have one spirit yourself, and it's not a spirit of fear, if you do have a spirit of fear, it's from an external source. So if we have people in the church that have any of these, it's a spirit and it's not from God. Anxiety or panic attacks, phobias of all kinds, nightmares, night terrors, visions of demons or monsters, depression, suicidal thoughts, manic depression, and others. Clearly, the result of all of these is that they can kill, steal, and destroy your life and quality of life. John 10.10 And in a Christian, destroy their witness and effectiveness for the gospel. Since that's the same goal as the demons, shouldn't it be obvious that fear is a spirit? Who benefits most if a Christian is living in fear? Gotta be the bad guys. Didn't come from God. He wants the exact opposite. He wants peace and rest and joy and power and a sound mind. So it had to come from somewhere, because the Word of God says it's a spirit, not a chemical imbalance or a bad habit or a random thought. Is the Bible the infallible, inerrant Word of God or isn't it? Is it reliable and true or isn't it? You cannot believe there's a war between good and evil and then deny one side has any influence. It just flies in the face of the blatantly obvious observations around us. We are getting creamed by the darkness. Inside and outside the churches, the badness is closing in. How did spiritual evil get such a strong foothold on this country and in our lives? Probably because we started preaching that demons weren't real and couldn't oppress Christians, that the war was over and we'd already won. Now who has benefited most from that bit of theology? Has it resulted in Christians who are free and living victoriously? Has it resulted in transformations of towns and countries for God? 
No, it has resulted in weak, oblivious, sickly, addicted, angry, divorced, oppressed Christians who are dropping out of church in droves because there's nothing there to really help them. Now, given the state of things around you, how can it possibly be true that the battle is over? Did Jesus win the victory? Yes, the outcome is certain. But have we claimed it, embraced it fully, and are walking in his power? No. If we were, the Christians would be free, and they're not. They're just not. For Pete's sake, we have people that are more addicted to football or NASCAR than to Jesus. We have witches in our youth groups and nobody even notices. We have Satanists sitting on the boards of our churches. We have pedophiles as priests and youth pastors. We have people cursing the pastor and the church in false tongues and nobody even knows. People say we should just focus on love and not bring glory to Satan by all this talk of demons. What? Whose idea would that be? This is a war. The Pentagon is going to have a strategy room where they get together, but they never talk about the enemy for fear of accidentally glorifying them and making it look like they're on the wrong team? No. They're going to learn where they are and how they act and how to best defeat them. They're going to assess their own strengths, amass forces in the places under attack, improve weapon systems that can counter the weapons of the enemy. They're going to know how they think, what they eat, how they smell, when they sleep, where they hide, everything. They are never going to spend one single solitary second debating about whether by gathering intelligence on how to crush the enemy they might be accidentally worshipping them. That's just dopey. In fact, it's a lie from the pit designed to keep us from talking about demons at all. Who benefits most from us avoiding the whole subject? Not Jesus. He didn't avoid it. He wasn't scared of them. He trained up his disciples on how to handle them and then sent them out to crush them. In fact, he commanded us to go crush them in the Great Commission. It's not the pick and choose commission. It's not the if it fits with my theology commission. It's the Great Commission. Be like Jesus. Go and crush the badness. We're getting creamed out there because of so many people that insist the enemy isn't even real or that it's wrong for us to go after them. Okay, fine, you win. I get it. Demons are real. So what do we do about it? If you don't have Jesus in your heart, then you're defenseless against the badness. You better lay everything down and beg for him to take over right now. And you better mean all, not some of your life. He's a king. Pray with respect. He's not fire insurance. He's Lord. Jesus is the Savior, and he died so that his blood could protect you from sin and from the enemy. Tell Jesus you're a sinner, say you're sorry, and ask him to free you of everything messing with you and take over all of your life right now. Go ahead, ask him. He'll do it. He wants you. He's been calling you. How long are you going to put him off? How long do you want to wait to be free? Believe he's big enough to break all the chains that bind you. In the name of Jesus and by his redeeming blood, amen. You see, there are only three choices when you hear something in your head. It's either you, the white hats, or the black hats. Now, you and the bad guys can sound a lot alike, because neither of you are holy. But when they whisper in your ear, they always put an eye in front of stuff to make you think it's your idea. I'm going to get even with that guy. I'm the best singer here. I could be like God. But what they're suggesting to you will always be Antichrist in some way when projected out. That is, we're to take captive every thought, 2 Corinthians 10.5. So when something pops into your head, just ask yourself, who's glorified most if I follow through with this? If it's going to glorify you or the enemy, then demolish it in the name of Jesus and refuse it. If you resist, he will flee, James 4, 7. He who, the enemy? Yep. My own thoughts and wants and selfish desires? Yep. Works the same way, Romans 8, 13. In fact, if you resist the Holy Spirit, he will flee too. If you harden your heart toward God, you won't be able to hear him either. Why is it important that we be cleansed of all the bad stuff? 1 Corinthians 10, 20-22 But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you would have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. You can't play for both teams. You can't play footsies with the badness and walk with God in righteousness and purity. Pick a side and stick to it. Ask the Lord to help you take control of your thoughts and turn your mind into the mind of Christ. Ask Him to let you see through His eyes so that you see the temptations of the world the way He does. If you burst into tears for the salvation of those poor girls on the Million Dollar Fantasy Ranch billboard and repent for your own part in the pain they suffer, it will be real hard to get overheated and lustful. There's a whole bunch of books and programs out there that can help you get all cleaned out. Sometimes they're called deliverance ministries or theophostics or some other name. But the blood of Jesus is sufficient, so just stand on your authority and do what the disciples did. Demand that it go right now in the name of Jesus and expect results. The mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ has power.
If we can help, get in touch with us, www.fellowshipofthemartyrs.com or FOTM at fellowshipofthemartyrs.com.